we're singing this morning. Turn in your Bible now to Colossians chapter 1, and I hope that you will follow along and ask the Lord to speak to you through this passage. A lot of times people will pick up a Bible, and I'm not talking about you who are super spiritual Christians, but you know those people. Those other people will pick up a Bible and just kind of flip through and randomly put their finger on a passage and read that, and that'll be their verse for the day. But the problem with that is when we do that, we tend to uh, impose our lives into the text and say, this is going to be the text for me today. And when we do that, we end up sometimes taking the text out of context. That's called eisegesis. It's try to try to read ourselves into the text. But actually what we should do is just the opposite. We should let the text speak to us. That means that when we look at the text, we don't put ourselves into it, which can can change and pervert and distort the meaning, but we try to understand what the scripture says, and then we understand how the text speaks to us. Now, the best way to do that, rather than inserting ourselves into the text, is to ask questions of the scripture as we're reading, as we're studying, and that's called exegesis, not eisegesis. So the text speaks out to us, not us speaking into the text. So uh, we ask questions of what it means. And some of those questions are uh, such as, uh, who is the author? And we look at at this text we're in in Colossians chapter 1. If you're not there yet, turn to Colossians chapter 1. But we ask, who is the author? We know that all Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture is inspired by God. So we know that God is the primary author, but then there's a secondary human author. And in this text, uh, it's uh, the Apostle Paul that has written this letter. Paul, along with Timothy, his, his helper and apprentice, has written this letter. Uh, and so we ask who the author is, and we ask what the context is. We know Paul has written this to the people, the saints at Colossae, and he's written it from Rome where he is in prison or where he is in chains. So that is the context that he is writing to them, and we come to understand a little bit more of the context as we read through his instruction and his uh, encouragement and his challenge to them. But then we also ask these questions. We ask, what does the text say about God? What does the text say about Jesus, God the Son? What does the text say about God the Holy Spirit? This text specifically is not where the Holy Spirit is not mentioned directly, uh, although we know the Holy Spirit speaks to us uh, through his word, and that's how we come to understand the truth of God's word is through the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But then we also ask, uh, the, you see the question number three, what does the passage say about us, or what does it say to us? What does it say to saints? So that should be on down the list. So when we first look at a passage, we should first try to understand what the context and who's writing, and then what does it say about God before we ever say or ask the question, what does it say about us? Because we get that backwards sometimes. So many times our Christian life is, is me-centered, but understanding what Scripture says to us must first begin with who God is and an understanding of who God is. So as we're studying a passage of Scripture, rather than inserting ourselves first, we ask, who is God? Who is Jesus? What does this passage say about God and Jesus? And then what does it say to us? And then finally, we get to this last question, or what are some principles or some points of application that we can learn from the passage? Usually we flip that and we ask that, that question first, but it's more helpful or more beneficial to us if we'll see what the passage says about God because really in all of life, if we'll discover who he is first, then the answer about how we apply God's truth to just real life is a lot more clear and a lot more evident. So we ask those questions kind of in that order. And I want you to do that exercise with me as we look at this passage this morning. We don't go it, uh, through it always this way, but I think in this context and this, uh, these couple of verses, really beginning the end of verse 12 this morning, it helps us to kind of understand what has taken place here and helps you to, to read, especially in some of the passages of Scripture that are more more theological, where really you could just go in and, and uh, try to understand the meaning of each word as it pertains to us, uh, as it can teach us. But that's different than a narrative passage that we might read, say, in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, that is uh, like some long stories that take place. And so we, we read and we study those a little different than we study a passage like the letter to uh, the Colossians or a letter to the, the church at Rome or uh, 
really many of, many of Paul's letters uh, can be just broken down and look very detailed into what is the, the theological meaning that is behind uh, some of these very specific phrases. So if you're there with me, beginning in verse 12 of Colossians chapter 1, it says, giving thanks to the Father. Now, let me stop here just a minute. We're picking up where we left off last week. Last week, we talked about uh, how Paul prayed this prayer, and he was giving thanks for those, those existing evidences, but then he was also praying for uh, that there be increasing evidence of the faith. And one of the increasing evidences that he was praying for them is that they would grow in giving thanks to God the Father. So that's where we pick up giving thanks to, to the Father who has qualified us or who has enabled us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So it's talking about God. It's talking about what God has done. God has done for us. He has qualified us. He has enabled us He's uh, uh, to share in the inheritance of the saints. For he, God the Father, delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. For he, God the Father, delivered us from the domain or the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have Redemption. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins through Jesus. Are you following along as I read? It's talking about God the Father has delivered us, transferred us into the kingdom of his Son, in whom in Jesus we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't say redemption and the forgiveness of sins, redemption plus the forgiveness of sins, but redemption. The forgiveness of sins. So the forgiveness of sins is, in fact, what that redemption is. Let's look this morning uh, first, because we already know the author and the context of this passage. Let's begin by asking, what does the passage say about God the Father? What does it say about God the Father? First, it says that, beginning in verse 12, he deserves our thanks. He deserves our thanks. We talked about that extensively Last week, that that is increasing evidence for which, uh, or of which should be evident in our life as we're growing in him. First, we see of the Father that he deserves our, our thanks. Secondly, uh, notice that he delivered us. He delivered us. Two parts there. He delivered us means to, to rescue or to, to snatch out, to take us from one place and put us another place. So he, he delivered us. He rescued us for our good. He rescued us for our good. Uh, He took us out of the domain of darkness, and he rescued us for himself. He took us out of the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son. So we see what the Father did there. He delivers us from one place to another place, from the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his son. So the Father deserves our thanks. The second thing we saw there in verse 13, he delivers us. At the end of verse 13, we see that the Father delights in the Son. The Father delights in the Son. It says uh, that he's delivered us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. His beloved Son. Now, we know John 3.16 tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so he loved us so much that he sacrificed his Son. But in no way does his... Uh, 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 love of the world and sacrifice of the Son negate the Father's love for the Son. The two are not exclusive, but actually it is inclusive. The Father loves us because he loves the Son and for the glory of the Son. Matthew chapter 17 verse 5 says, just three references for you. Matthew 17, 5 says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. John 3, 35 says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. John 5, 20, The Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. So we know that the Father delights in his Son. As we're looking at the passage, we see that uh, the Father has, uh, 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 he, he, he deserves our thanks, our increasing evidence of our giving thanks for him. The Father has delivered us, and the Father delights 
in the Son. Well, the second question then is what does this passage say about that Son? What does the passage say about, about Jesus? First, we saw already that he's delighted in by the Father. The end of verse 13, the Son is delighted in by the Father. Next, we see that the Son delivers us by redemption. By redemption, that redemption is the forgiveness of sins. Redemption was a word used to buy something or someone who was in the possession of another. It's not unlike uh, being liberated from slavery into freedom. And in Jesus, we've been redeemed or we've been purchased from condemnation and being set free in righteousness. That's an important truth to, to get hold of. So transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the sun or the kingdom of light is to be redeemed. It's to be purchased from slavery and then set free in uh, Christ, in our freedom of forgiveness. So he delivers us by redemption. Let's move to the next question. What does this passage say about or uh, about me or about us or about followers of Jesus? If we'll back up into verse 12, we'll notice that we are declared to be saints in the kingdom of light. We've been enabled to share in the inheritance of the saints. You've been able, enabled to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. We can kind of fly over those last two words, and that's really why I wanted to start there, the end of verse 12. He qualified us or enabled us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. In reading it, our mind just kind of says we're, we're qualified to share in the inheritance of saints. And then we move on to the next verse. But, but in, in light, and in light is there intentional because it, it helps us to see the contrast with verse 13 because we are in saints in light delivered from the domain of darkness. So what does this say to us as followers? We are first declared to be saints in the kingdom of of light. Secondly, we're delivered from the domain or the dominion of darkness. I'll explain that more with an application point here in just a little bit. But then we also see at the end of that verse, we are delivered to into the kingdom of the sun. We are transferred from a domain of darkness into the kingdom of the sun, kingdom of the sun, kingdom of the light, synonymous. That's not two different, those are not two different places uh, that saints have an inheritance, but that's where our inheritance lies. It is in the kingdom of the sun, in the kingdom of light. And that kingdom of the sun is not only the same as the kingdom of light, it is separate from the dominion of darkness. Well, that should make sense. It should make sense to us, right? Is that, is that confusing at all? Kingdom of light should make sense to us that it's separate from the domain of darkness. Right? I'm going to tell you why that's a little confusing. Apparently, it's confusing by the activity of our lives. Because sometimes, and for some reason, I think I know the reason, but quite often, we who've been delivered from darkness into light still for some reason return to living in the darkness when we've been taken out of that into light. So uh, there's a separation for saints separate from the dominion of darkness. Now light and darkness are found throughout Scripture in a number of different ways used to portray good versus evil. The light is used uh, as that which is uh, made or or to make visible, the light is used, or the word light is used to describe righteousness in contrast with sin. The word darkness is often used in reference to spiritual separation from God. So we were separated from God in the domain of darkness, and we've been delivered into the kingdom of his son. Darkness also used to describe sin or sinfulness. So there's a distinction between what we once were under the domain of darkness as those lost, separated from God without Christ, 
And then in forgiveness, we've been transferred into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the sun, which is separate from the domain of darkness. Now, this is, this is pretty simple this morning. Just, just three quick points of application. I really could go back and, and give you probably ten points of application in this, but I just want you to hold on to three principles of application to be learned in this passage. Number one, sin tries to hide under the dominion of darkness. Sin tries to hide under the dominion, under the authority in the realm of darkness. Darkness suggests secrecy. Secrecy. I, 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 and I'll just tell you, I don't have any experience in this, but uh, other than watching on, you know, cop TV shows. But have you ever known of a bar? Have you ever known of a beer joint that has a lot of bright windows and the lights are already on? Now, I'm not asking for you to raise your hand and confess that. And I'll just tell you, because my dad is in his room watching this at his uh, assisted living apartment right now, that I don't have experience in this. But I've seen it on TV that when you go into those places, those places, it's, they're dark. They don't have a lot of windows. They don't want a lot of natural light. My wife, what her, her first thing in the morning, she wants to walk through the house, if we're going to be home all day, and turn all the lights on. I'm like, well, you know, God made the sun come up outside. There's enough light coming in, but she wants to turn all the light. She likes all the light being on. I'm just the opposite. I'm like, just keep the blinds closed, the lights off. We can see. We're fine. It's not because I want to pretend I'm living in a beer joint, but. <laughs> Nor am I trying to hide sin. But sin tries to hide in darkness. If there's no sin, what do we need to hide? If we're living in righteousness and obedience and faithfulness to the Lord, that's not something we should hide. That's not, not something under which we should try to be disguised or hidden. Sin tries to hide from self. Because sometimes we, we try to deny or even rationalize our own sin. That's hiding from self. Sin tries to hide from others. And sin even tries to hide from God. With Psalm 139 verses 11 and 12, we'll tell you we, we don't hide from God. Because everything is exposed before him. He is light and in him is no darkness at all. But sin tries to hide under the cover, under the secrecy of darkness. But in Christ, we've been delivered from the control and dominion and authority of darkness. Sin no longer has authority over you in Christ. So don't say, the devil made me do it. Don't try to use Flip Wilson's excuse. Some of you remember who Flip Wilson was. Uh, don't try to use the Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it, excuse. You don't have to operate under the authority of sin, of darkness any longer if you are in Christ. Romans six fourteen says, For sin shall not have dominion, or sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. So sin tries to hide under the dominion of darkness, but we are children of the light. That's a principle, that's an application that should be evident to us when we realize that we've been delivered from the domain of darkness and made residents of, made inheritance of a kingdom of light. I don't know all of you. I would guess that maybe some of you have an inheritance that you either have received or are looking forward to receiving someday. A good inheritance. If you receive that inheritance, 
I'm just curious, how many of you will take that inheritance and go, ah, I don't want it, give it back? So I'm just going to go back out and live in poverty or live without. I don't know anybody that would do that. Now, I know people that might take the inheritance they received and use it for good or use it for ways that might not be about themselves, but I don't know anybody that would say, that inheritance, that is, I don't want that. That's no good at all. And then choose to go back and live the old way. But we've been given the benefit of, we've been enabled to receive the inheritance of the kingdom of the sun, the kingdom of light. So because we've been given that inheritance, why would we ever choose to go back and deliberately live under the domain and control of sin? We wouldn't. But when we know who we are in Christ, that our identity is changed, that we're given an inheritance, we're different, we're saints, it changes the way we live. It changes the activity. It changes the deliberation and the intention of our lives. Number two, in Christ, there is no fear in life nor in death. In Christ, there is no fear in life nor in death because verse 13, we've been transferred into the kingdom of the Son, same as kingdom of the light. In Christ, there is life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and what? The life. No man comes to the Father, but by him Jesus is life. So if we are, in fact, in Christ, because we've been delivered from darkness into light, because we've been forgiven of our sin, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness, then in Christ, there's no fear. There's no fear in life, and there's no fear of death. And there's no fear in death. I like what the commentary Barclay, uh, commentator Barclay said, God has given us a light by which to live and by which to die. So in Christ, there's no fear in life nor in death. In the kingdom of life, there's no fear in life. There's no fear in death. Let me say that again for those of you who want to write that down. God has given us a light by which to live and by which to die. So in Christ, in the, listen, if we're still in the dominion of darkness, if we are still trying to work our way out of here, which we can never do, by the way, we can never be good enough to climb ourselves out of the pit of sin, but because we've been delivered out of it into light, there's no fear. There's no gripping, paralyzing fear of who we are, of the circumstances we face. Why? Because the same God that can deliver us is the God that can sustain us. The same God that can sustain us in life can save us in death. So in Christ, in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the Son, there's no fear in life and there's no fear in death. If you ever meet a Christian who is somehow captivated and controlled by fear, take them to this passage. Help them to see what God has done, who God is, what Jesus has done, because we no longer have to live under that control, that domain of fear, that domain of darkness. But we can live free from that fear. That's who we are in Christ. Number three, God rescues us to remain in him, not return to sin. God rescues us to remain in him, not to return to sin. Verse 13 again says that he has delivered us from that domain of darkness. The word delivered means to rescue or, or to, to snatch. It means that God has pulled us out of danger, has snatched us out of danger, and brought us to himself. I don't know if you're uh, a YouTube watcher or you watch Facebook reels or those kinds of things, 
But there are a bunch of videos on, uh, on YouTube that show these super dads, you know, like dads snatching their kids from the jaws of, angel, uh, of uh, danger. And it'll be a whole bunch of clips put together. And it's like super dad watching TV and little Johnny's about to fall off the couch and dad just goes like this and grabs him. You know, or, or they're walking out, dad's mowing the yard, and here comes little Johnny about to run out into the street, and there's a car coming, and he just snatches him back. Or the little child is walking in there to the kitchen, and, and he's about to put his hand on a hot stove. You know what the dad does? The dad just, just sits there and hugs him and lets him touch the stove. Is that what he does? Of course not. The dad, he snatches him back. And you know the incredible thing that happens, usually when you see those pictures, they'll snatch them up and the dad will stop whatever they're doing and they'll just hold on to that child. Because they know, the dad knows better than the child what he just delivered them from. And that's what God does for us. When he snatches us out of the domain or the dominion of sin and death and darkness... And he delivers us to himself. Why, when you are held securely in the arms of the Lord, would you ever choose to even stick your toe back over in the domain of darkness? He delivers us from sin and to himself. There's been a lot of attention this past week over a series of commercials that were on during the Super Bowl. You know the ones, if you don't know, just please don't bother watching them. If you didn't watch the Super Bowl, God bless you. You miss seeing the wrong team win. Anyway, (laughs) the He Gets Us commercials. The one that caught the majority of of the attention of the world, according to the social media reaction, both positive and negative, was where the the, the image is that, that Jesus goes and hugs a person in their sin. The message condoned is that God condones a person right where they are, remaining in their sin. And some people say, well, that was just, it's just a teaser to begin a conversation about who God, listen, I know, I know way enough about the campaign to know what their ultimate end is. And it's not what you would want it to be. But there's this implication that, that, that God condones or Jesus condones remaining in a lifestyle of sin, a a better way to do these commercials would have been for somebody dressed like Jesus to fly in and to snatch those people out of those places. Because that's what happens when he delivers us from the domain of darkness. He doesn't come into the domain of darkness and dwell there with us. He snatches us out of that to live separate, to live a life that is secure. Security doesn't come over there with the drummers. Security comes over here with the organists. No offense, Steve, really. <laughs> See, if you were up here, you'd give it a prumps. You follow me? So when the scripture says that he delivers us from darkness, he rescues us. The word meaning to, to snatch up from something delivered to somewhere else from something to himself, the kingdom of the Son, then he has, as the point says, rescued us to remain in him, not to remain in sin. And as saints, going on into verse 14, as saints, we've been redeemed, purchased from condemnation, and set free in forgiveness. We talked about guilt and shame a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, earlier in this passage, in this study. We 
when he delivers us from sin and takes us to himself, he doesn't bring with us that shame and that guilt of the past. Redemption cuts the cord. Redemption cuts the strings of guilt and the weight of sin that try to come along with us. Let me just give you this one verse, and I'll, I'll shut this down this morning. But John chapter 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever follows me will not remain in the dominion, the domain of darkness, but will walk in the light of life. As you read these passages, particularly Colossians chapter 1, chapter 2, Philippians chapter 1, chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, that talk about who we are, who you are in Christ, let the identity of Scripture determine how you view yourself. Let the deliverance of Jesus deliver you from the domain of darkness and walk in the light of life. Scripture determines who we are, not our feelings, not anybody's opinion. The only opinion that matters is what the Word of God says about you.